we're going to continue in Exodus today. We're going to continue <coughs> talking about those daggum Israelites. <laughs> Can you guys say that? Those daggum Israelites. You know, when you're saying those daggum Israelites, you're actually talking about yourself, too. Um, because we, we are just like the, Is- the dem- dem daggum Israelites. <laughs> I need to stop saying that or else I'm actually going to slip up and say a different word. Um, but Exodus, we're going to be in chapter 16 today. Um, this is a very, uh, very familiar verse that we're going to be in, very familiar chapter we're going to be in. Exodus chapter 16. And we're going to cover a lot of scripture today. Um, so just buckle your, your, your seat belts. I was going to say pew belts, but we don't have pews. We have seats. So... Buckle your seatbelts, and we're going we're gonna to take a ride here on these uh, verses. So um, let me go ahead and pray first and just invite the Holy Spirit in again to, to take these words of mine and to use them according to his work, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much again for who you are. I thank you for all of those attributes that we just sang about um, and the fact that the fact that um, a sweet little girl was singing right behind me, mighty to save. And knowing what what could have been, and but what wasn't, because you are mighty to save, because you are Jehovah Rapha, a, the the ultimate healer, Lord. Um, I pray right now that you, your Holy Spirit, take these words, that your Holy Spirit come out, and your Holy Spirit take these words, and then you mix them with your um, with your power, and that people can take these words and apply them to their hearts and apply them to their lives today. Lord, let me decrease and you increase and you get the glory and honor and praise for everything that's said in this place right now. And it's in Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're going to be in chapter 16. We're going to go through verses 1 through 18 today. Um, So before we get there, have you guys ever stopped to think about what the most common uh, phrase is? That you hear somebody say to you is, or the, or maybe the most common phrase that you say yourself. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Um, like I can think, Robin, she says, "Oh good, oh good gravy," or "Good, good gravy goodness." She says that a lot. Um, or Shucky Duckies. That's another one of her phrases that she says a lot. <laughs> um, but there's one phrase that um, my son, <laughs> I'm picking on him today, I guess. Um, usually it's Addison, but today it's him. <clears throat> and usually it's Robin, actually, but today there's one, one phrase that my son says over and over and over again. And we hear it probably, I would say, at least 10 times a day, maybe not, maybe more. Um, and that phrase is what we're going to deal with today with the Israelites. That phrase is, I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. We literally hear that. Like when he gets hungry, we hear about it. I'd say at least 10 times before he gets some food in his stomach. Uh, that's the honest, honest truth, isn't it? Everybody that knows him, that has heard him, they can vouch for that. Um, the other word that we hear from both of them all the time, and this one applies more to the little girl, is I'm bored. I'm bored. So they're either hungry or they're bored like most, the majority of their lives. They spend the majority of their lives hungry or bored. Um, but anyway, I say that because that's exactly what we're getting into with the Israelites here, Okay. Now think about, as before we get into these verses, think about what all we have covered with the Israelites so far. What all God has led them through, okay? What we just left off with last week was they were thirsty. And so they were complaining about being thirsty. And they went to a place where they found water, and the water ended up being what? Bitter. Um, And so they complained about that. And then God miraculously took a tree and used a tree and used his power with that tree and turned the water sweet to where they were able to drink. Today we're coming up to hunger, okay? Um, and this reminds me, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about bread today um, because that's what exactly what <clears throat> uh, God provides for them in this scripture. Um, but it reminds me of some diets <laughs> that we've gone through in our marriage, in our, in our life. And, and Robin actually, um, she loves these kind of diets because they work for her. <laughs> but they do not work for me. Have you guys ever heard of um, the, what was it called, Atkins diet? You ever heard of that, the Atkins diet? Um, or I can't think of the other one right now. But there's And then the, the most recent one is called the keto diet. Have you guys heard of that? That's blown up lately, like in the last few years, the keto diet. 
The basis for all of those diets is that it's a restriction on carbs, okay? Which, I love carbs. <laughs> Say amen if you agree with me if you love carbs, okay? But the reason why Robin, this works so good for Robin is because she loves carbs too, and so when she, when she starves her body of carbs, then it really works for her. And I've seen, I mean, when we've, gone, when we've done it, I've seen some results and stuff like that, but um, the one thing that those diets do, though, especially the keto diet, when we have done the keto diet, the one thing that that does, especially the first week or two, is you feel like doo-doo. <laughs> doo-doo caca, <laughs> as Garrett says, and Michael says. Do, you feel like doo-doo, you do. You have no energy, you're like depleted of all of your nutrients and energy, and because that's what we, our body lives on. Our body lives on carbs, and because carbs are calories, and that's what our body works on, okay? And so when, you're, when you deprive yourself of carbs, then you, you feel lethargic, you feel sleepy, you feel tired, you don't feel like doing anything. And so I will never again do keto diet um, because there's some other things that kind of go along with that that kind of disprove keto and stuff like that. But it leaves, the thing about it is, the most important thing is it leaves your body feeling deprived. It really does, okay? It leaves it feeling depleted and deprived and wanting more and needing more, okay? That's exactly what we're getting to with the Israelites right here in this, in this chapter that we're coming up to, okay? <clears throat> we're there, God has just provided water, sweet water for them in a miraculous way. So they're, they've gotten water, and they, they've been able to sustain with the water that he provided them, okay? But now there's another complaint that they, rate, that they bring up against Moses, and it's their, they want their bellies full. They want their bellies full. And don't we have so many people in this world... And I hate to say it, but in church world, that wants their bellies full, but nothing else, yeah. right? Yeah. But what God wants to show us, the title of the, the, ser the sermon today is a divine depletion. So we've, we're looking at all the divine things that he does for, on, to the Israelites to make them realize and turn their attention to him. Because that's ultimately what he's putting all of this on the Israelites for, is to turn their attention on him and turn their hearts to him. And to realize that he is God, and he is glorious, and he is going to be the one that provides for him, okay? So today is a divine depletion, and what I want to say is, the way God works, when we are depleted of ourselves, is when God wants to develop our souls. When we are depleted of ourselves, when we finally come to the end of ourselves, is when God truly wants to develop our souls, but you have to come to the end of yourself first. He can't develop your soul if you're still full of yourself. Amen? And so we're going to see that. We're going to see that with the Israelites right here. But most of all, he puts this in here because this is a timeless truth. This is timeless. This is a timeless word. It transcends time. Okay? It was good 100 years ago. It'll be good 100 years from now if we last that long. And it's good right now. And then you can apply it to your life right now. Amen? Okay, so we're going to look at four truths about why God leads his people into depleted places. Why he leads his people into depleted places. And we come to depleted places in our lives. Amen? Would you agree with me? Amen. Where there's no other resources. And kind of the story that I shared about, about Jen and, and Lainey, they were kind of at a depleted place. Because they're, they can't, there was nothing they could do at that point. To change what the outcome was going to be. But you can change your outlook. And you can praise him in the storm and praise him anyway. And that's what God is trying to teach the Israelites right here. Okay, So let me jump in. We're going to be in chapter 16, verse 1. I'm going to read a little bit and then kind of expound on that. And then read a little bit more and then expound on that. So um, honor the, the word of God in your hearts right now as we, as we begin. Are you ready? Say amen if you're there. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> chapter 16, verse 1. The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of sin. Now, that wilderness, that sin right there, that doesn't really have anything to do with actual sin. Okay, But what we do see is we see that there is sin involved in the wilderness and sin. And you'll see that here when we get into the rest of the scripture. But that doesn't actually mean that they're led to sin. 
Okay, because a lot of people have tried to take that and say, oh, God led them to the wilderness of sin. So he led them to sin. No, God doesn't lead you to sin. Okay, so just get that in your minds right now. But there is sin in the wilderness of sin. Okay, so he led them to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. So the first thing that we see here, the first thing I'm going to stop right there because there are some stuff in this this first verse that I'm going to get to. The first thing that we see there is we see that depleted places lead to grave positions. That's the first point. Depleted places lead to grave positions. What I mean by grave positions is like where it's you're in grave danger. Okay. Have you ever heard that saying before that phrase before you're in grave danger like this? I'm in a grave situation. That's what I'm talking about here. That's where the Israelites find themselves. But the first thing that you got to see is that depletion leads to decrease. So think about where they were at. They were in Elam. We left off last week when they were in Elam, okay? And what was in Elam with them when we left off? Not just water. They had 12 brooks of water, 12 springs of water. But they also had 70 date palms that they could eat dates. I mean, I I don't know if I could live off of dates, honestly. But (laughs) dates and water, that doesn't sound like a very good diet to me. But at least... They, they had an abundance of water and abundance of dates that they could live off of, right? Um, but the thing is that we got to realize that it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long for God to lead us from blessing into a place of depletion. And he does that for a reason, okay? But they were on the journey for a whole 30 days. This, this is where we're at now, right now. We're at, we're at about 30 days of when they're on this journey. So about 30 days from the time that they left Egypt is where we're at right now. So you think about it. They've already gone through a couple struggles already in 30 days. Okay, So it doesn't take very long for God to lead us into depleted places. And what he's wanting to do in that is he's wanting to decrease how much you're relying on yourself. Okay, Because the the Israelites were in Elam for probably about 27 days is what we see. Because it was three days before they made it to uh, Marah where there was no water, and then he led them to Elam. And so you're looking at about 25, 27 days that they were in Elam, okay? But God often leads to places, he leads out of blessing to show us just how little we have on our own. He does that in our lives too. So if you're in a place where you are extremely blessed, which we all can say that we're extremely blessed, amen? I mean, if you really look at your situation, um, You can say that you're extremely blessed. If you have finances at all, you're blessed. If you have health at all, you're blessed. If you have possessions at all, you're blessed. Whether you like to, whether you want to be more blessed or not, that is on you, but you're blessed, okay? And so the Israelites were blessed while they were in Elam because they were living off of what God provided for them in the last miracle that they had. But sometimes when we get so blessed, we can get a big head. We can get a big head and say, oh, look what I've accomplished. Look what I've earned. Look what I've done. Look at the job that I've got. And God often leads us away from that blessing to show it's not you, big boy. It's not you. It's not anything you've done. And so I wonder if the Israelites were at that place right now. If they were thinking, oh, man, we got it made. We're here now. We're, we're good. We still got to make it to the promised land, but we're good for a little bit. So let's, not just, let's just not leave here, right? But God had other plans. Okay. The other thing that we see is that it doesn't last long. The place of depletion, the place of decrease that he takes them on, it doesn't last long. It puts into perspective how the amount of blessing that we have compared to the amount of stressing that we have. Because think about it. It was three days in, and then they started complaining because they were thirsty. He led them to bitter water, then he led them to sweet water and food. They were there for 27 days. And then he leads them away, and they already start complaining again. The amount of blessing they had way outweighs the amount of stressing that they had. It's the same in our lives. God leads us away from blessings so that we can rely on him more, and it makes us appreciate the blessings more. And If you look at your life, we have way more reasons to be blessed than we do to be stressed. Amen? 
The second thing that it leads us to, it leads us to depleted places lead to grumbling people. And that's going to be in verses 2 and 3. Read with me on with verses 2 and 3. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, and tell me if this sounds familiar. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land in Egypt. When we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted instead of, instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make the whole assembly die of hunger. Can you believe the, the nerve of the Israelites? They already said that to, they already said that to Moses. They already said, if only we had died in Egypt. And God provided through that, and here they are again in the very same place spiritually, and they're still crying out, complaining against Moses, saying, if only we had died in Egypt. But we see here that depletion, so this depleted place, depletion leads to desperation. Depletion leads to desperation. This wasn't the first time that they complained. Remember, okay? In Exodus chapter 15, verse 24, they complained. Um, that was where they complained about the water, okay? It says the people grumbled to Moses, what are we going to drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the water. It's not going to be the last time they complain either, just to give you a little forewarning, okay? In, verse, in chapter 17, verse 2, I'll go ahead and read that for you. It says, they went on, they, he, so he provided for them what we're going to see that he provides for them. And then he moves them on and it says, um, so the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. So <laughs> they complain about water. He gives them sweet water. They complain about food. We're going to see what he provides for them here in just a minute. And he takes care of them. I'm just going to, just to, just to um, tell you what's going to happen. He does provide for them. Okay. Then they leave there and then they complain again about water again. Like, God's not going to take care of them again, okay? But we as Christians, we as born-again Christians, if you're a born-again Christian, we don't know anything about that kind of complaining, do we? Do we? Mm. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. It's funny to me how Christians are sometimes the most complaining people. We see that we should be the most grateful people. But yet we find so many more reasons to complain than we do to be grateful. And it shouldn't be that way because if we, just, if we really looked at how God provides for us, I mean, we have this building to meet in. We, they didn't have buildings when Jesus was around. They didn't have buildings that they could stay in and they could meet in every day. The, the, it says the Son of Man didn't have a place to lay his head. But yet we have a place to lay our head. We have buildings to come in. We have coffee to drink. We have... Amen for coffee. Can I get a Can I get an amen for coffee? <laughs> um, but we have so many blessings, yet we're the most complaining people. And you, we wonder why people look at Christians and look at the church and look at uh, Christianity and say, "I don't want to be anything like that," because they're nothing. They're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. I think a lot of it has to do with the complaining and the words that come out of our mouth. And doesn't he say that out of the heart? comes through the mouth, right? But yet we're supposed to be the most grateful people. And the thing that we see here is that we see it wasn't just a few of them. It says there, it says that the entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The entire group of them. I, and I, I have to imagine there were probably some that weren't necessarily complaining. But what it means is the great majority of them were complaining. They were grumbling. They were complaining, right? Have you ever heard the saying that misery loves company? That's how complaining spreads. Is you get one person that has an issue with something, whether it be, I don't know, music or... I'm talking about in church, okay? Music or uh, the way we do offering or the way we the way somebody dresses or whatever it may be, or it's too hot, it's too cold, I don't like the color of the walls, I don't like the color. You get one person that has something to say about that, and then they say that, they go to their circle, their close friend, and they say something about it, and then before you know it, it spreads like wildfire. And then you have, you either have everybody 
up in arms about something or you have a divided people, which we don't want either of those, right? Because it's called, we're called to be of one mind in unity. But misery loves company. So we have to be aware of that whenever we're using our words. Are you building somebody up with your words? Are you, trying, are you tearing them down with your words? Ephesians 4.29 says everything that we say should be edifying. You can edify. You can criticize somebody and still edify them at the same time. Did you know that? It's called constructive criticism. What is the heart of what you're trying to say? And what is, are you trying to make them a better person by the criti criticism? Or are you just trying to tear them down by the criticism? That's the, what we have to look at, okay? They weren't trying to build Moses up and build Aaron up by their criticism right here. They were saying, you basically suck as a leader. <laughs> Even though, who was really leading them? God was leading them the whole time. Did they forget about the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire? The Lord. Right. And who were their complaints against, though? They were against the leaders, against God's chosen men to shepherd his people. How often are we so quick to have something to say about those who are leading in positions of le leadership, whether it be in church or I'm just going to, I mean, I'm going to say the nation too, because, you know, God is directing who is leading our, na our nation. He is. He was directing it when Obama was leading it. He's directing it while Trump is leading it. He's going to direct it here come November, whoever leads it then. God is directing it all. Amen. He's in control of it all. But yet we're so quick to complain about who is leading. Are we, are we complaining more or are we praying for our leadership more? Because we're called to pray for our leadership. Right. Right. Amen? How do you expect the Holy Spirit to work in leadership if we're not praying, saying, asking the Holy Spirit to lead and guide our, our, our leadership? And if they're not Christians, lead and guide Christians to lead and guide them into God's ways, Right? That's how we do it, is by praying for them. Look at how our nation as a whole is just completely bashes our leader. The same thing happens within the walls of the church, too. It does. We should be praying for our pastors. And I'm not just saying that because I am one. I pray for other pastors because, especially in this day and age, especially this time, this last six months that we've had to go through, it's been the, I, I can vouch, because I am one, it's been the hardest time to be a pastor in this nation with what we've had to go through in the last six months. We need to be praying for our pastors. We need to be praying for our youth, like our youth leaders, our youth pastors. We need to be praying for our music ministers. We need to be praying for our deacons. We need to be praying for our uh, treasure. Well, I forgot what your title was, Mike. Treasurer. <laughs> your finance directors, whatever. Biz fin Mike. Money man, whatever you want to call them. Mike just needs prayer anyway, right? Amen. <laughs> Whatever his title is, he just needs prayer anyway. That's true. But no, everybody is that way. Don't we all need prayer anyway? But how much more do our leaders need prayer? They need it so much more. Because you know the leaders are held more accountable than the non-leaders. It's true. And so they need your prayer. We need your prayer. We'll find out later who their complaints were actually directed at. Indirectly. They were indirectly directed at somebody else. They thought they were directed at God. I mean, well, I just gave it away. <laughs> they thought they were directing it at Moses and Aaron, the leadership. But really, we're going to see that it was directed at God. Because God is leading them the whole way. Right? Here's the other thing. Depletion. This depleted place that he will lead us to that causes grumbling people. Depletion leads to delusion. It will. Depletion in your lives will often lead to delusion in your lives. Like you will think you had it better when you were a sinner than you have it now as a Christian. That's exactly where the Israelites were right here, okay? Israel selectively remembered the past and thought of their time in Egypt as a good time. They did. That's what it says there. It says, if only we had died at the Lord's hand in Egypt... When we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. That's all they could remember about their time in, in Egypt? Really? Did they forget 
how they described it earlier in Exodus, in, in chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, they worked the Israelites ruthlessly and made their lives bitter with difficult labor and brick and mortar and all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly imposed all this work on them. Did they forget about that? All they could think about because of the depleted state that they were in, they got delusional about it and they were like, oh man, we had it real good in Egypt. If only we had died by all that, all that food that we had. We get the same way. We get the same way. We think that when we go through a hard time, because God has depleted all of our resources, that we had it much better. Like this Christian life just isn't worth it. Because we had it much better when we were a sinner and we didn't have to be held accountable. We didn't have to be holy. We didn't have to live at a higher standard. We think sometimes that we would have been better off if we had never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But that ain't, that's not true. At all. It's not. Because if you didn't come to the same knowledge of Jesus Christ, you would not have a future and a hope. And you wouldn't have the Holy Spirit getting you through those hard times. We have to remember that. We have to remember that God leads us through those places for a reason. So that we can turn our hearts and turn our eyes to him. They also seem to forget every single miracle. Think about it. Think about what all God has done for them. Okay? Let me just name a few. A staff became a snake. And Robin didn't say amen to that because she hates snakes. But they literally watched a staff get thrown down to the ground and turn into a stake. And then pick, not a stake. They wish they had turned into a, st a stake. But they literally thought, saw a staff get thrown on the ground, turn into a snake, and then pick back up and turn back into a staff. Water became blood. Frogs, locusts, and gnats everywhere. He killed off all of, the Egypt, all of Egypt's livestock. He caused severe boils all over the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. Big sores on, on their skin. He brought a severe thunderstorm and hailstorm, and then caused it to cease with just a spoken word. He caused complete darkness all over the earth for three days. Are they forgetting about all this? He ultimately killed off all of the Egyptians' firstborn with the Passover. But yet, all of the Israelites' firstborns were spared. That is the miraculous power of God. He parted the Red Sea. That same staff that turned into a snake was held up over the Red Sea, and it parted. And they walked through on dry land. And then, when they got to the other side, the staff was held up again, and the Red Sea swallowed the Egyptians. Wiped out their enemies. The death trap for their enemies. Their dead end became a death trap for their enemies. Right. Most recently, he just turned bitter water into sweet water with a tree. Oh yeah, not to mention that, that cloud of, that pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that's leading them every day. Did they forget about all this? Did they for, we are so often able to remember the bad and we forget about the blessing. We have to keep our eyes on the blessing. <laughs> It's all about keeping your eye on the blessing is not going to change your outcome necessarily. But it's going to change your outlook. And it's going to grow you in the meantime. That's why in James, when it talks about going through various trials and considering a great joy, that's what he's talking about. Is when you go through a trial and you focus on the blessing that you have through the trial, that's going to get you through the trial with great joy. And you're going to build endurance to, to stand the next trial. Because you know what? Another trial is coming. Guess what? Another trial is coming for the Israelites. Amen? Right. How quick are we to forget what all God has done in our lives? When we're facing tough times, when we are spiritually or physically starving, we're so often to forget what all God is doing in our lives. We, I, I read a story, um, and that there's actually more to this, and I can't remember right off the top of my head, but there's somebody that complained that had a rough morning, okay? And raise your hand if you've ever had a rough morning. You may have had a rough morning this morning. Sundays are usually rough mornings for people, right? Because you know why? Because Satan doesn't want you to come to church. That's why Sundays are a lot of times the hardest mornings. But if you've ever had a rough morning where you get in your car, and this actually just happened to us last night, uh, happened to Don and Richard last night. You get in your car and you're going places and either the car breaks down or you get a flat tire. You run over a cinder block and you get a, a flat tire. That literally just happened to us last night. That's why I'm throwing Richard under the bus. But even though it wasn't his fault, but... <laughs> 
And so we're so quick to complain, okay, about the car breaking down or the fat, flat tire breaking, the flat tire happening. But yet, do we forget how blessed we are to even have a car? Or how blessed we are to be able to call your son and daughter-in-law or your daughter and son-in-law to come help? I didn't, even, I, I didn't help change the tire. He had it all changed before we got there. But, but we did come, and we were able to take the tire and put it in the bed of my truck. Do we forget about how blessed we are to have that? How blessed we are to have the means to buy a new tire? Or to get your car fixed? Or say a refrigerator or an appliance goes down at your house, and we complain about that. Or do we forget about how blessed we are to even have an appliance and have a house to begin with? Or young people. We get, we comp how quick are you guys to complain about having to go to school? <laughs> Poor Hayden. He, I'm throwing him under the bus again. He had to do, I know that's three times. He had to do virtual for a week and a day this week, this year so far, okay? He's going to school. Um, and you know that there's half and half, there's a lot of kids that are just doing virtual and then a lot of kids that are doing, he complained about having to go to school. And then when he did virtual for a week, he complained about being virtual. And then when it was time to go to school again, the very next day he complained about going to school again. Like, dude, you have to, at least you have an education, right? At least you have a dad that's willing to take you to school. You could be busting it, you could be walking. Charles can say amen to that, right? You, didn't you have to walk 10 miles up a hill <laughs> covered in snow? And, <laughs> right? <laughs> but at least you have, look at the blessings, okay? How quick are we to look at the bad things and forget the blessings? We have to keep our eyes on the blessings, amen? amen. If he saved you and didn't do another thing in your life, Guess what? He is worthy of all glory, all honor, and all praise for the rest of eternity. Amen. Amen. And everybody in here can say amen to that. Right. Because of his grace, he's worthy of all praise. Amen. amen. We would not be here. We would not still be alive. We wouldn't be able to have a building if it wasn't for his grace. We wouldn't be able to stand up here and preach and to share the love of Jesus like we did on Friday if it wasn't for his grace. But God, but God is faithful and loving and he will continue to keep his promises but guess what we just have to seek his presence and his power that's all he asks of us he's faithful to keep his promises we just have to be faithful to seek his presence and his power in our lives that's what remembering the blessing is about remembering that god is in control and even though we're going through a hard time i know he's going to pull me out of it and i know i have way more to be blessed about than I do to be stressed about and I know he's going to continue because he is my provider he is I'm going to get to this in a minute but he is Jehovah Jireh we learned about one of the names of God last week Jehovah Rapha the Lord is he our healer this week he is Jehovah Jireh Amen. the Lord is our provider even when you don't think you're you have enough to provide your family God is still your provider Amen. we just have to be willing to seek it we just have to be Willing to seek his presence and his power. Matthew 6, 33-34. Jesus has something to say about that. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. He's talking about the basic necessities of life right here. The, same, the very thing that Israelites are complaining about. Food. He's talking about the very necessities of life right here. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His presence and his power. And all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When you worry about tomorrow, you just add more worry onto your worry. Because you can't do anything to change tomorrow. You can't do anything to change yesterday. All you can worry about is what is happening today. And what, how much presence and power of Jesus that you're asking into your life. And how much you're seeking him each day that's what we have to do when we're depleted we either have the choice to complain or to commit we have the choice to grumble or to grasp onto god's promises let me repeat that when we're depleted when he leads us to a depleted place we have a choice to either commit to complain like the israelites did or to commit to god and to commit and say, I know you're going to lead me out of this. 
to either grumble like the Israelites did or to grasp onto God's promises and his blessings and his power and his righteousness. We have to choose to commit and to grasp onto it. Amen? Amen. That leads us to the third thing. Depleted places lead to God's promises. <laughs> Depleted places lead to God's promises. That's the third thing that we see in these depleted places, this divine depletion, okay? Read with me in verses 4 through 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to aim into this. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread down from heaven for you. The people are going to go out each day, gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether, they, whether or not they will follow my instructions. Mm. Could it be that a testing in your life is to find out if you're willing to follow God's instructions or not? Amen. I mean, but yet we so often choose to disobey his instructions or not even disobey, but just kind of ignore and just we have too much we have too much going on in our lives. We're too busy to follow his instructions. Maybe he's making you go through a test in your life to find out if you'll follow his instructions. On the 6th day, when they prepare what they're bringing, what they're to bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, "This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt." Like they shouldn't, like they didn't know already. I mean, really. In the morning you will see the Lord's glory because He has heard your complaints about Him. Mm. He has heard your complaints about Him. For who are we that you complain about us, Moses continued. The Lord will give you meat to eat this evening and more than enough bread in the morning. For he has heard the complaints that you are raising against him. Who are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. As Aaron was speaking to the entire Israelite community, they turned toward the wilderness and there in the cloud of was the Lord's glory appeared. What that makes me think of is that in the cloud, you know, the cloud was the Lord's glory. Maybe it shined a little bit brighter at that very moment. Mm. In our time of need, doesn't his glory seem to shine a little bit brighter? If you seek, if you turn around and face it like they did, they turned around to face it, turned around to face the wilderness and his glory shined a little bit brighter. So, but we have to see here that depletion, the depleted places... When he depletes us of our own resources, it leads to dependence on him. That's what he's trying to teach the Israelites right here. He promised to rain bread down from heaven. Think about how absurd that sounds. Think about, right, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. That actually, if you guys haven't seen that movie, um, it literally rains meatballs and stuff. Um, it's all kinds of food, doesn't it? Yeah. But think about how crazy that sounded the israelites right here like he's literally going to rain bread down bread down from heaven what we have to realize in our lives though is god may provide from resources that we never knew existed i'm having to cling to that promise especially hard right now um because i don't have a paycheck coming from the afcu anymore <laughs> And so I, but I know that God is going to, I know he's Jehovah Jireh and I know he's going to provide in resources that we don't even, like, I don't even know they exist right now. I know he's going to because he called me away from it and he has a bigger purpose for me stepping away from AFCU. I know it. I'm clinging to that promise and I know he's going to be Jehovah Jireh because he always has been and he always will be. Sometimes he provides from familiar resources, but sometimes they're unexpected resources. Sometimes there are unexpected relationships in your life. Sometimes there are unexpected phone calls in your life. Sometimes it is monetary. Sometimes you get an unexpected check in the mail. I love it when that happens. When the electric company says you overpaid and they send you a check for a hundred something dollars, that's like, amen, right? But you never know where it's gonna come from. You never know where God is, God is gonna provide through. Just like the Israelites, they, they heard that he was gonna rain bread down, bread down from heaven and I'm sure they were like, rain bread down from heaven like we barely figured out what rain was now you're going to make bread be the rain he gave them clear instructions on how they were to gather it though 
And that's the instructions that he's talking about, making sure they're going to follow. God promised to send bread down from heaven, but he didn't promise to drop it in their mouths. God promises to bless you, but he doesn't promise to just drop it in your mouth. We have to follow his instructions, and we have to work like it depends on us, but pray knowing that it depends on him. That's right. And he will bless. He's just not going to drop it in your mouth just because you, you feel obligated, like you feel it's owed to you. So many kids today feel like everything is owed to them, right? We live in the most me-centered, me-focused generation. But God isn't going to bless you by just dropping it in your mouth. You have to follow his instructions. You have to seek his presence. You have to seek a relationship with him. And then you'll start to recognize the blessings. They still had to go out in the morning and gather what they needed for the day. And then on the sixth day, he said they were to gather enough for two days. You know what this is a sign of? The Sabbath day. The Sabbath day hadn't been instituted right now. Not yet, anyway. Because they haven't gotten the Ten Commandments. So he hasn't gone up to Mount Sinai. That's when he institutes the Sabbath day. Okay. But didn't God rest on the seventh day when he created the universe? So he had already preluded to the Sabbath. Now he's, this is another prelude to the Sabbath. He's, want, he's wanting to see if they're going to follow instructions. And guess what? I'm going to give you, we're not going to go get into the rest of it because we're stopping at 18. But guess what? They don't. <laughs> they, they find a way to screw that up. He gave them specific instructions, and they find a way to screw that up. But so many times that's our lives, right? Doesn't he give us specific instructions on how to live, how to talk to people, how to love? And yet we find a way to screw it up. He also promised meat every evening. I'm sure they were wondering where this meat was going to come from because all of their, all their cattle, all their livestock, everything that they depended on for their food, I'm sure it was all dying out. I'm sure it was all uh, depleted, right? But the main thing is, he promised that he heard their complaints. He promised that he heard their complaints. The text mentions it actually four times in these few verses. Did you know that? It mentioned that he heard their complaints four times. And the complaints weren't actually against Moses and Aaron, like they said. It was against God. Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. God hears grumbling. So he hears when we grumble. Listen to this, because this is very important. He hears when we complain. He hears when we grumble. But he also knows the heart behind the grumbling. That's deep. He knows when we grumble. He hears it. But he also knows the heart behind the grumbling. So our, what is the reason for your complaining? What is the reason for your grumbling? What is, is it to build the church? Is it to build up others? Is it to basically tell the devil to back off? Not today, Satan, like we talked about on Wednesday. Or is it to satisfy your own desires? Because most of the time when we complain, isn't it to satisfy our own cravings? And our own desires and our own preferences, right? God knows the heart behind the grumbling. So make sure the heart is pure behind the grumbling. Most of all, he promised that they would know it was his glory, know that the Lord delivered them, and that they would see his glory. Shouldn't they have already known that? Shouldn't they already have known that it was God that delivered them? I mean, Shouldn't it be obvious to us of God working in our lives? Even in the little things, God works in our lives. Look to give him glory for everything he's doing in your life. All of a sudden, after all the complaining, because God heard the complaints... He was about to show up and show out because of his grace. And how do we need his grace? Because so many times, the heart behind our grumbling and complaining doesn't deserve his grace. But that's what grace is. Grace is 
not getting what you do deserve or getting what you don't deserve. One or the other. One's mercy, one's grace. I can't think of it right now right off the top of my head, but one's mercy and one's grace. Hey, we've been, guess what? We need them both. And we don't deserve them both. We see the last thing here, that the depleted places lead to God's provision. Depleted places lead to God's provision. Let's finish this out. Let's read verses 11 through 18. The Lord spoke to Moses. I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you are full. Mm. God gives us enough bread to eat until we're full. Amen. Guess what? Just a little prelude to the end of this. This is the bread of life right here. Jesus is the bread of life. This is, the, this is our daily bread. And there's enough in here for you to get full on every single day. He provided... Oh, i, I got to finish reading. <laughs> Until they're full. Then you will know that I am Yahweh your God. So at evening, quail came and covered the camp. Out of nowhere, these birds came and covered the camp. Because think about it, they're in a desert. <laughs> Do you think quail live in the desert? No, I hardly, I hardly doubt it, or I hardly believe that. I seriously doubt it. Okay, Quail came and covered the camp. In the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the, des on the desert surface, as fine as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, What is it? <laughs> Even though God just told them what he was going to do, right? And they see this fine frost covering the ground, and then they look at each other and they're like, well, I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's God's blessing. Maybe it's what he just told you he was going to do. Moses told them, you dummies, it's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each person needs to eat. You may take two quarts per individual according to the number of each of number of people each of you has in his tent. So the Israelites did this. Some gathered a lot, some gathered a little. When they measured it by quarts, the person who gathered a lot had no surplus, and the person who gathered a little had no shortage. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat, and they were taken care of. Miraculously, God provided. Depletion Depleted places lead to delivery. They lead to God delivering in your life. He provided faithfully, exactly as he said he would do. Quail came and covered the camp at evening. In the morning, dew covered the ground, and when it was evaporated, there were fine flakes of bread covering everything. And then the Israelites said, what is it? You know why they said, what is it? Do you know what manna means? Manna in the Greek or in the Hebrew means what is it? That's what it is. It is what it is. Just kind of like God is, I am who I am. The manna is, it is what it is. What is it? It's manna. It's bread. It's the Lord's glory for you, poured out for you. God provided for them, but they didn't recognize it. God met the needs of Israel, but he did it in a way they didn't expect. Same goes in our lives. When God's provision comes, we often don't recognize it. That's why you have to be tuned in to this. Right. Tuned in to the whole, do everything in the Holy Spirit. Do everything in the Spirit. Because you know what the Spirit is? The Spirit is like little antennas that pick up on things that you would not normally pick up on if you were not in the Spirit and you were not in the Word and you were not prayed up. That's how you recognize the blessing in the little things. I saw Michael doing the little antennas. <laughs> That's why, you, have you ever heard somebody say, get your spiritual antennas up? That's what it's talking about, the spirit. Because antennas pick things up from far away. That we, like, that's why insects, insects have antennas, because that's how they get around, and that's how they, um, that's how they navigate. That's how we navigate lives, our life, and how we navigate God's blessings and trials is by having our spiritual antennas up to recognize his blessings. He provided perfectly. This is crazy to me. Some gathered much, some gathered little. At the end of all the gathering each day, not a single family had too much or too little. Jehovah Jireh. 
He is our provider. He's the perfect provider. He's the ultimate provider. He is the provider of ways when they, there seems like no ways, when it seems like it's not going to be enough. He's the provider that makes it enough. He balances everything out. That's what. Do you think everybody in the camp knew how much or how little every single family needed? No. But God did. And he provided exactly what they needed, exactly how they needed, exactly when they needed it. Jehovah Jireh. Depletion, last thing is, it leads to our daily bread. It led to the Israelites' daily bread. When we're depleted of ourselves, which I hope everybody can say amen in here that you've been depleted of yourselves. Can you say amen to that? Because if you can't say amen to that, then you don't know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because you have to come to the end of yourself to come to him. There is no other way but to empty yourself of yourself. What is our daily provision that this symbolizes? It's God's word. God's word is our daily bread. That is our daily manna. He provides it every day. Notice they gathered in the morning. It's good to come to his word in the morning. Because how are you supposed to have your daily needs met if you don't come to it in the morning? I've, it's good to read the Bible anytime. Amen? Can I get an amen to that? But it's so much better to read it in the morning. Because you're going to have needs come up during your day that you're going to need to depend on this word on. That's the only way that you can depend on it is to come to it in the morning. Notice he provided the manna and they had to gather it in the morning. Same goes with our daily bread. It's always accurate. It's always just enough. It's always exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. It always supplies exactly what we need and exactly when we need it. Jesus is our bread of life. Because Jesus is the word. Amen? John 6.35 says, I am the bread of life. This is Jesus talking. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Let us not be a spiritual complainer about bread and water like the Israelites were. When you taste of the bread of life that the Bible says, which is Jesus, you'll never be hungry again. When you get out of the word and you get out of the spirit, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get hangry, actually. <laughs> You're going to get hangry. That's what the Israelites were right here. They were hangry. So hungry, they were complaining against Moses and Aaron, but really complaining against God. Don't get hangry. Get filled by this every day. Get filled by Jesus every day. When you get out of that is when you get hangry. The word never there when it says that the one who believes in me will never be thirsty again. That's like one of the most emphatic no's in Greek. It's like never, ever, 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 ever will you be hungry again. But you have to seek this daily. You have to seek it daily and let it fill you. Not only did the Lord give guidance and safety to Israel, but he provided their needs. Unfortunately, Israel spent more time complaining about their condition than they did praising God for his provision. Let me say that again to a way that applies for us. The choice is ours to complain about our condition or to praise him for his provision. It's our choice. It all depends on your outlook. The choice is ours to complain about our condition or to praise him for his provision. Let's praise him for his provision. When we praise him for his provision, you never know what the power of God is going to do. Are you a complainer or are you a praiser? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And have you learned to trust him every day? Because they had to do this daily. They had to trust that he's going to rain down bread from heaven every day. And guess what? He did for 40 years. They fed on that bread for 40 years until they didn't, need, they didn't have a need to feed on that bread anymore. 40 years. He'll do the same for us.
We have to trust him to provide it every day. Jesus is the bread of life sent from heaven, and we have to receive him like Israel received the manna. This is how they received him. They were aware of their need. They were hungry. They were hangry, actually. We have to come to God hungry and aware that you need him. They received it each for himself, family by family. Only you can get the food that you need from the Bible. Nobody else can provide you what you need from God's word. Right? Amen? You have to seek his word to provide for yourself. For him to provide for you. You have to seek it every day. They had to go out every morning, every day. And they had to trust him. Humbly. We have to receive it humbly. I can imagine the Israelites had to go out and gather this manna on their knees sometimes. Hmm. We have to receive this humbly on our knees sometimes. With gratitude, knowing that they didn't deserve what he was providing them. Actually, with all the complaining, guess what they deserved? They deserved him to wipe them, wipe them out. Guess what we deserve? We deserve to be wiped out. But instead, he provides for us because he's Jehovah Jireh. And then eating it, taking the gift inside to our innermost being. We have to do that with his word. You have to do all of those things. Come to it hungry. Come to it on your own. Come to it every day. Come to it humbly. Come to it with gratitude that he provided it. And take it in. And let it satisfy you. Let it nourish you. Like only the word of God can. Because when you let it nourish you, you will never be hungry for what this world has to offer again. Because this world... This world offers a lot of carbs. Because you know what happens when you eat a lot of carbs? You eat a lot of spaghetti, you eat a lot of rice, guess what? You're hungry again in like 30 minutes. That's what the world offers. His word makes you satisfied to where you're not hungry for anything the world offers. 